Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 8. And begin reading in verse 22 and then through chapter 9, verse 7. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 22. And they shall look unto the earth, and behold trouble and darkness, dimness of anguish, and they shall be driven to darkness. Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation, when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea. Beyond Jordan, in Galilee, of the nations, the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shine. Thou hast multiplied the nation and not increased the joy. They joy before thee according to the joy in harvest, and as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For thou hast broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor as in the day of Midian. For every battle of the warrior is with confused noise and garments rolled in blood, but this shall be with burning and fuel of fire. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there, sh there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. We had looked at the first part of this last week. We want to uh, continue with this. But as we mentioned last week, here it was that Israel was in great darkness because they had been in captivity. They were, they were, you know, under great difficulties. And the thing that could lift them from that, the people that dwell in dark, darkness have seen a great light. And that's with the birth of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And let me say today, if there's anyone here today who don't know, who doesn't know that light through Jesus Christ and, and dwell in darkness. We look at our world today and it seems like the whole world is in darkness practically. We look at that. But the light that we see, the light we praise the Lord for is our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who's the way, the truth, and the life. And so we think about this. As we said, as we uh, pray for our country, uh, there's a great deal of spiritual darkness in our country. And there's a great deal of difficulty. And uh, we uh, just pray for those and uh, they're in earnest need. By the way, be sure to pray for Pam. Uh, her respiratory condition has gotten worse. And uh, we, we really need to keep her in our prayers. And uh, so I hope you remember that. But darkness and gloom, we're all about. And they won't, this won't, the darkness won't last forever. The sinners of the people, for them, it's only perpetual darkness apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're thankful that through Him, He brings light unto us and that we don't dwell in darkness anymore. But for the people of God, for the nation of Israel, This gloom will pass away. We trust those who know Jesus Christ as your Savior, Lord, will be able to testify that that darkness you may have experienced in your life before you were saved by grace uh, through Christ, not of anything that we've done, not by any merit, nothing uh, because we're so good or whatever. All have sinned to come short of the glory of God and we dwelt in darkness. And the only thing that brought light to us is the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're thankful uh, that we're told in Scripture that before the foundations of the world, we were chosen in Christ. 
we're thankful that in, in Genesis 3, as re was read, that the seed of the woman shall conquer the serpent. And we rejoice in that. And that conquering continues to go on. We're thankful that Christ is called the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And He shall rule. He'll make His enemies His footstool, we're told in Scripture. And we rejoice this. We won't always uh, dwell in darkness, but by grace, as we've been delivered from our sins, we give God the glory and the thanks for it all. We think about these uh, tribes that were identified, Zebulun and Naphtali, which dealt therein, uh, being most remote from Judah. It was nearest to the foreign countries and to the heathen influences. Not only the location of the, of the area that contributed to the disgrace, but it had been the first to tremble in awe before the might of it, Assyria. This area had been despised, even in New Testament times, and was glorified when God honored it. When the promise of the prophecy occurred, when Jesus Christ, the Son of God, dwelt in Capernaum. The sin of Israel brought upon her as a nation the darkness of punishment. As we said we see much wickedness in our day and time. A couple of the articles that we have in back. One of them is, is about what's happening to the Christian schools. What they're going to do with Christian schools. They're not going to allow whatever accreditation is for that particular college or university that's, that's a Christian college or Christian university. As long as they refuse to support the promotion of perverse lifestyles. They'll remove that accreditation and they won't ever have it. That's what's being planned right now. And uh, another thing that's being perpetrated is uh, some of the things that promote other types of perversity. But it's a terrible thing. You know, Israel wasn't the only nation in darkness. We see a great deal of darkness in our world today. But the hope of the world the only hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we celebrate His birth and rejoice in it. In the, pay, in the place of, of the darkness, of the calamity of the people of Israel, they saw this great light. They saw the light of peace. They saw the light of blessedness. And in place of darkness of death, as one man wrote, the light of life. In the place of the darkness of ignorance, the light of knowledge. In place of the darkness of sin, the light of salvation. And we give Him praise for it. And may our thoughts be upon that this very day. We pray that everyone here knows Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And that you know that you've been delivered from that darkness. And you too, just like Israel, have seen a great light. You that dwelled in darkness, you've seen a great light. And we give God the glory and the praise for it all. And we sing with great joy when we sing these hymns about the birth of the Christ child and about those events taking place. And as we said, in the place of the darkness of sin, we dwell in the light of salvation. Salvation, as one man wrote, in its widest sense, had sinned upon these people, had shined upon these people. A complete reversal of their condition had occurred. He said, we've been delivered from that darkness too. A complete change. And as we mentioned this before, we one time had a heart of stone, but he's given us a heart of flesh. And he's made us one of his own. And we rejoice in that. It says that he calls us by our name. I still think that just boggles the mind. I just think of the many people throughout history who have come to know Jesus Christ as Savior Lord by the sovereign grace of God and, and by His sovereign choice to come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior, just stop and think. He says, He's called you. He's called me by name and called us unto Himself. And we give Him the praise for it all. 
we also see that uh, there was a complete reversal. The darkness in which the people dwelt was the shadow of death. It was deep and it was of death. And the only way that it could be removed is through the light of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Only a light was able to bring us to eternal life. Only a light was able to bring us the promises of heaven. Only that light was able to shine in our hearts when we had seen that great light. When Christ, departing from Nazareth, went down to Capernaum and dwelt there, and we see in Matthew chapter 4, verses 12 through 17, Matthew chapter 4, beginning at verse 12, and now, now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed unto Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the sea coast, in the borders of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea and beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light has sprung up. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So the very thing that had been prophesied centuries before in the book of Isaiah was fulfilled during the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. We also know where the scripture tells us in Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2 in verse 14. And there we read, well, I'll again read verse 13. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Or, as that reads in the original, and good and to men of goodwill, to men of goodwill, it makes all the difference in the world. I know there are those who think that they can join in with those who walk in the way of darkness and uh, and, and praise them, but that is not what the scripture says, and to, that we demonstrate this peace in knowing that our sins have been paid for. The blessed thought that the light has shined upon the darkness, Galileans, caused Isaiah to address the one who's the source of that light and whose light alone we may see light. When the light came, God brought the Gentiles into the true Israel in fulfillment of the promise which he made to Abraham, we said, I will make of thee a great nation. I will make of thee a great nation. Thus, as the Gentiles were added along to the people of Israel, they became greater in number. In Isaiah 54, verse 1, Sing, O barren, that thou didst not bear, break forth into singing, and cry aloud, Thou that didst not travail with child, for more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. While the nation was enlarging, and joy itself increased, the result of this mighty act of God in multiplying the nation was a joy to his people. It was a joy to those who know Jesus Christ as Savior Lord. We talk about, we mentioned this before, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. The world can't satisfy to, to cause us to joy. The world can't do that. Walking in darkness can't do that. Fulfilling pleasures that only appeal to the flesh, that can't. Uh, give us joy but we ought to remember the responsibility that we have 
that all that we do, we do it unto the glory of God. Only by the means of, of our sovereign God, that this mighty work of salvation, do we truly rejoice. Do we truly rejoice and praise Him for the joy that otherwise could not come. In chapter 9 of Isaiah, and verse 4, For thou hast broken the yoke of his burden, and the staff of his shoulder, and the rod of his oppressor in the days of Midian. For every battle of the warriors with confused noise and garments rolled in blood, but this shall be with burning and fuel of fire. And it's interesting to see this list now that starts where it says with the word for. For every battle of the warrior is with confused noise and garments rolled in blood. But this shall be with burning and fuel of fire. Where we see this word for, the prophet presents the reason for this great rejoicing as we have in, in that verse. And we do praise him for it. And Jesus Christ is the hope of this world. Jesus Christ is the, is the hope for it. And, and he, he will reign and he continues to reign. And he's our King of Kings. And he's our Lord of Lords. This was a burden. It wasn't, however, like a, a rod or something that pushed through a person. It was a more grievous burden. It was a heavy burden of sin and corruption. That's a heavy burden to bear. You can't bear it. You fall under the weight of it. It's only when that's lifted, and that darkness is conquered, that we can praise God. One man said, As every beast of burden and toil is beaten with a rod, so Israel also had a rod with which it was beaten on the neck and shoulder. There was also in Egypt an oppressor who used the staff to strike the beast. The suppressor was the Assyrian enemy, and in far deeper sense, it was the bondage which sin itself had brought on. Sin is a bondage. We're servants of sin, and that's the word is slave. We're a slave to sin, apart from being delivered by the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it's a mighty victory that comes our way as we're delivered from our sins it was a spiritual battle, uh, one, because a child would be born. It was a spiritual battle because the victory considered and the deliverance of God's people from that darkness and from all that oppressed them. Sin is a burdensome yoke, as one man wrote, where it subjects a man to slavery in which, like the beast of toil, he is under a taskmaster that beats him. There, there is only one who can set a man free from the yoke in which he has been found, and that one is God. The act of delivering man from sin is a mighty victory, so mighty in fact that man could never have won it any more than Gideon unaided could have conquered the Midianites. Then again the word for in verse 5. For every battle... Of the warriors with confused noise and garments rolled in blood. This shall be with burning and fuel of fire. And this word is given good reason for our great rejoicing and being delivered. Following this victory, which has been mentioned, there's a complete peace. Peace I leave with you. And uh, we've mentioned before that the word peace speaks to us and it talks about, it means to bring together what had been separate. We were separate from our Heavenly Father uh, because of sin and what brought us together. Our precious Savior uh, taking upon Himself our sins and dying in our stead on the cross and our being saved by the grace of God that brings us together. It's like we take the term that's used in Scripture, there's a great gulf fixed. And there was that great gulf that was fit that was there between you and the Savior because of sin. And it was a heavy burden that, that we bore, but didn't even think about it. In many cases, some do. I think it's a grievous, grievous thing that we hear about in our day. 
about the number of suicides are just increasing huge amounts in the, during the last several months, just huge increases. I feel grieved when we hear about Montana, I think has about the second highest suicide rate in the nation. I'm grieved when I hear about soldiers, very, very high uh, death rate amongst veterans of, of being in the military. But along with those that's mentioned here, there's no need to mention the destruction of these implements, of these weapons. The weapons will be gone if the soldiers are gone that are spoken of here in this passage, those who are the enemies. They're no longer needed. A child is born. His birth will bring peace to his people. He will kill himself. He will himself be the Prince of Peace. And as we read before in Luke chapter 2, 14, about glory to God in the highest on earth, on earth peace among men, men of his good pleasure. And then in verse 6, again 4. For unto us a child is born. And then 4 understood again, unto us his son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Always have thought. You know, the ACLU, if it had been around at that time, they'd say, no, 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 no. You know, the government can't be on his shoulder. Got to have separation there. Got to have separation. They got another thought coming. They have another thought coming. The government would be upon his shoulder. He said, he who is called the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, shall rule forever and ever. And where the scripture talks about, um, where Christ said, all power is given to me in heaven and in earth. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Not just a certain degree of it, but all power is. And we praise him for it. And where it talks about, uh, about this child, we look at this, where it said, where it says that a child has been born, that he will be. A child that's been given, he will be given. A child that has been, will be. And a child that has called, will call. We know that Isaiah is not speaking of something in a past occurrence for the simple reason that to do so wouldn't yield a good sense when it predicts the birth of our Savior. It's a promise there. Further, where it notes this child whose birth is here mentioned was one whose birth had been foretold in chapter 7. A sign had been given that a virgin shall bear a child. And, and that's a sign that was given. And we rejoice in that. It's still a sign. And uh, I remember that there was a... Dr. Machen wrote a whole book on the virgin birth of Christ. It was the most excellent uh, book written on that particular subject, and it still maintains that particular position. But upon this child, the government, with all its responsibilities, lies. Like a burden, it rests upon his shoulders, and he will rule because he's king of kings and lord of lords. Isaiah has spoken about one of the punishments which was to come upon Judah was that children would be its princes, that they would rule over, they'd be ruled by a child. Here, here however, not only is a child to be ruled, but the entire responsibility of the administration of that rule would belong to him. We rejoice in that. This government is a kingdom of grace that's spoken of here. But it's also, in its widest extent, the kingdom of nature, the kingdom of power. All power in heaven and in earth is given unto me, in Matthew 28, 18. And we give him the praise and the glory for it, and we trust that he will bless. In chapter 7, as we had read, the mother named him Emmanuel. 
God with us. I mentioned before, and I'll just mention it again, when we think about the incarnation of Christ and uh, the little girl was asked, you know, what does, what does the incarnation of Christ mean? She said, that means God with clothes on. And that was the way she thought about it. And I think it's a good picture. You know, we, it's, uh, children often have a way to express things in a very interesting way. The thought is that the child is worthy to bear these names. His name should be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty, <coughs> the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. He bears those names. And he's the one whose birth we celebrate and whose birth we rejoice in. And he's the one that delivered you and delivered me from this darkness that we see in our lives apart from the Lord Jesus Christ when we still were under the burden of sin. We were called. And he called us by name. And he gave us everlasting life. To God be the glory. Great things he hath done.